Okay, so uh, I, uh, I'm really pleased to uh, be here today. I know I'm uh, facing a, a big challenge because uh, your uh, blood uh, flow circulation uh, is uh, really slow and uh, you're critical on ca caffeine. So, uh, but we have some extremely exciting news to share with you. We've been um, working three years, almost three years, on this research project uh, on uh, uh, seismic horizon education using deep learning on this. And uh, so I hope you're going to be able to stay awake during these uh, 17 minutes. Uh, but the first, I want to give uh, the most important slide in the beginning here. Acknowledgements to um, uh, our uh, um, collaborator, uh, uh, North Central Norwegian Computing Center. They are really clever, and we wouldn't be here today if uh, we wouldn't have that collaboration with them. As well as I have some very skillful people in uh, the company. Okay, so rewinding three, four years, uh, we asked ourselves, what should we target? Because we saw what um, deep learning was able to do, uh, uh, and we saw these groundbreaking results in many different fields. But how could we, or how should we, apply them within seismic uh, interpretation? So we could, of course, um, go for the faults, as um, many have done and are doing still. We could go for the horizons. We could go for stratigraphic elements, teach deep learning how to see the stratigraphy. We could learn them how to uh, uh, see the DHIs. Or we could also learn them to see phases, or specific phases, as uh, gas chimneys and salt. Or we could actually also learn them to de detect geobodies and geomorphology. We decided to go for, sorry, <coughs> we decided to go for the horizons. It's the high-hanging fruit. It's difficult to pick, but it tastes a lot sweeter. <laughs> Seismic horizon interpretation is done in two ways. It's, uh, uh, or not two ways, in two areas in the company, either in exploration or in production. In production, we're very much focused on the reservoir zone, understanding uh, the field in detail, but in exploration, we're more occupied with getting the more uh, regional understanding and uh, having uh, using the key horizon interpretation. Now, since I'm... Um, in the exploration technology part of research, it was natural to pick the key horizon interpretation as our goal. So this slide is just to point out that we have tested many various ne uh, uh, neural networks, uh, architectures for segmentation, for detection, for 2D and 3D. And uh, even though we have experienced very good results with uh, uh, several of these uh, uh, architectures, UNET is not surprisingly the one showing best results. So this is how our method is working today. Uh, we have pre-trained a network uh, by uh, selecting some carefully 3D volumes with interpretation. So the interpretations and the, uh, the volumes have been uh, uh, qualified. And um, uh, within our target cube, we interpret a small selection of lines, so this is typically done in Petrel. Uh, we move the lines over to the cloud, and we fine-tune the pre train network, do our predictions, and we do some easy post-processing, automatic post-processing, so we get rid of all uh, the noise, the spikes, and so on, and we move the results back to Petrel. So, uh, obtaining quality training data is a hassle. Now, the first headache is all the varying interpretation of quality, even in a superb company as Equinoid. There will obviously be uh, a varying size of quality in the interpretation and texture and different key horizon interpret. So we start out with synthetics, but we, we knew, we recognized that we had to move very quickly over to real data. So how to quantify results? And uh, uh, we've uh, uh, chose uh, a method that's been uh, mentioned several times earlier today, precision and recall, and a combined uh, method of precision recall, the F1 score. Uh, but the thing that we had to uh, uh, think about is that, yes, you have a label truth. And how close should you be to the label truth to be recognized as a correct answer? 
So we chose a window that was uh, regarded from the interpreter as acceptable. So the first experiment uh, was on the Horta platform, um, a CGG survey. And uh, we um, uh, interpreted uh, uh, some uh, uh, lines, some sizes of lines. Uh, there were 12 key horizons in this. And um, we wanted to compare this with our uh, auto tracker that's being used, the patrol auto tracker. So these are the real results, F1 score results, averaged over all cross lines. And uh, it's quite interesting to see that uh, the, the clean horizon net uh, shows predictions between 80% and 100%, which is very good. Uh, the auto tracker performs almost just as well uh, for most of the key horizons, apart from the three circled uh, uh, horizons that we see here. And these were the top Alder, base Shida, and the top Colonia. Uh, and the next slides will give great examples of how Horizon Net surpasses the auto tracker. So let's start with the first one. In the top all um, we have the auto tracker at the top, we have the horizon net at the bottom. This is uh, uh, right here at a trough, uh, but actually there is a phase shift uh, in the top all uh, So you can see that um, uh, the auto tracker is struggling, uh, but the horizon net in most cases uh, don't. This is the map surface of Topoli, and shows also how nicely uh, the horizon net terminates uh, the surface at the truncation line, and doesn't continue on the con unconformity. That so shows a lot more detailed, a lot more nice structure. The second difficult horizon, which our track was struggling, but the horizon net managed uh, quite well, was uh, the base Shida. Uh, this is a quite subtle it's on a very, uh, I would say, subtle uh, peak in uh, uh, the seismic. And it, as you can see, the odd tracker, it, um, um, I would say, it, it jumps down on a more stronger uh, reflection uh, at the first uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, this is um, the surface map for the base data, horizon to the left, odd tracker to the right. Um, so, also here we see that the horizon net is actually has been learned how to uh, cope with uh, the truncation line. The last one, top Colobian, is also a very subtle uh, uh, reflection, very subtle event. It's on a, a peak that you can see maybe below this uh, strong uh, 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 event which the auto tracker has picked. Um, and the other tracker gets tempted, jumps on this uh, uh, event, while uh, Horizon Net has recognized and actually stays on this weak signal. And uh, actually, we found the Horizon Net result quite impressive. So the conclusions on this first experiment was that Horizon Net never failed in the test. It had an F1 score between 8 and 9 percent. Uh, the auto tracker failed on some of the uh, horizons, and also auto tracker struggled, of course, with uh, those uh, uh, horizons that had a phase shift. So, natural question to ask: Was this too good to be true? Uh, we then this summer performed our second experiment. Uh, due to some uh, license, I mean export issues, we picked uh, uh, a survey in uh, outside Ireland because the cloud is an island, so we managed to cheat a bit. Um, we chose the Porcupine Basin, um, and uh, as earlier, we uh, want to compare the results with the auto tracker. So there were eight key horizons here. We focused mainly on uh, uh, the lowest stratigraphy. And I'll, I could have given you several examples, but I'll uh, uh, give you uh, a couple. Uh, one, uh, the BC is quite difficult because on uh, uh, the ridge, let's see, uh, around here, uh, we have a phase shift, which uh, obviously uh, our tracker is not able to pick up. The horizon net does a reasonable good job. 
So we did also uh, an exercise. We um, did some quick manual cleaning of the obvious mistakes from uh, HorizonNet. We made some info invitation and grid the surface. So the result on the right here is from, uh, sorry, to the left is from uh, uh, the HorizonNet. Uh, and on the right, we actually have the assets uh, official uh, interpretation. And uh, it's quite interesting to see um, how HorizonNet has managed to capture all these structural details and, and it, it, it surprised the asset uh, quite a lot. It's also important to point out that the asset, they had used four days to do uh, the interpretation on the right, while we actually in total used less than one day. If they had wanted to do the same accuracy, they would have, I, I, I could promise you, they would use a lot more than four days. But HorizonNet doesn't work everywhere. And in this case, basement is, um, is a very difficult pick. Um, and that's due to the depth, the seismic signal, and the changing expression. Uh, so the result from HorizonNet here to the left, it's doing a reasonable job where, we, you know, where I've uh, circled in, but it really fails when it's too complex uh, in, in, I would say, 75% of the area. So as you've seen, uh, we have achieved great results during these past three years, uh, but it has been challenging. And um, uh, I found this uh, descriptive uh, timeline from uh, Adam Grant's uh, TED Talk, which is uh, actually uh, described our process as well. Because when we started out, this is awesome. And then we tried it out on real data, this is tricky. It became even more that this is crap. We question ourselves, are we crap? <laughs> the important thing is that you still you struggle. You continue. You don't give up. Because then we came into face, this might be okay. And now we're at, actually, back to this is awesome. <laughs> so the questions we have answered is that trained deep learning networks are able to perform quality seismic horizon interpretation. And the CNN HorizonNet based on UNET shows the best results. This deep learning uh, network performs better than the automatic interpretation when horizons become subtle, discontinuous, or contains a polarity shift. Now, I also want to uh, uh, give this on the bar here. So the easy horizons are being interpreted by the artifact, and the difficult ones by manual interpretation. Now, what we see the horizon that could be applied in is the area where uh, the horizons are subtle, and this could save the interpreter a lot of time. <clears throat> Our goal is to push that further towards complex horizons. So the future work is to test it out in um, other uh, geographical areas with different geology, and also we don't see any reason why it shouldn't work on 2D service as 3D. So that's going to be also part of our next, uh, next experiment. Of course, we're going to be searching for better or improved network models, and we need to improve also, or we want to improve the efficiency of these uh, uh, networks. And of course, the interpreter needs to have this on their button. So we need to integrate in a good way into the interpretation tools and work. So my last two slides are actually to directly to the community here. Because um, uh, John Thurman, a colleague of mine, and I, we, um, when we started on this, we uh, uh, identified that the uh, SAE, they had, had made a categorization for vehicles' self-driving ability, ranking from level 0 to level 5. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. And this has been accepted throughout the whole uh, sorry, uh, automotive uh, industry. Uh, the Teslas, Audi, and the Jags, uh, you know, with these uh, uh, electronic cars, they are typically at level two. Actually, Elon Musk, he stated in April that we will be at level five in mid-2020. I don't believe that, but okay, I'm an you know, addicted Audi driver. <laughs> <laughs> now, John and I said, why, not, why should we, why shouldn't the industry have something similar? So we came up with the first version of the levels of seismic interpretation. 
And um, uh, I'm saying it's the first version because I would want uh, input from you, from the industry, uh, how actually we should rank the levels of our networks. So next year we could say that actually, you know, this, um, uh, uh, this network on fault imputation is level three or level four. The horizon net, I would say it's a mono plus, it's a level two. So uh, anyway with that, I would just...